All statements and opinions expressed by guests of the Adult in the Room podcast are strictly their own and do not necessarily reflect the beliefs or opinions of the host, producers, or advertisers. All interviews are presented in their most complete possible form in the interests of free speech. No statements should be interpreted as financial, legal, or medical advice. Listener and viewer discretion are strongly advised. It's the Adult in the Room podcast with Victoria Taft. That's me. Welcome to the Adult in the Room podcast. I'm Victoria Taft. And how are you today? I am great because we have the great Conrad Black with us today. He is the Baron Black of Cross Harbor. He is the Right Honorable Lord Black of Cross Harbor, and he's on the Adult in the Room podcast. And we're grateful to have him. He has as many lives, I think, as he has names and titles. He is a man of action, a man who acts with a pen and a laptop. He probably does crossword puzzles in pen and much more. In fact, he could do the crossword puzzles in any of his uh, the newspapers that he has owned over the period of years. And he owned for a time the Daily Telegraph was the publisher, Chicago Sun-Times, the Jerusalem Post, the National Post out of Canada. And he's owned hundreds of community newspapers throughout North America during his time as a publisher. He's out of it now, but he's not left the newspaper business. He's still in it because he writes columns uh, every week for the National Post. He is a capitalist, an unabashed, unafraid to say capitalist. He's a historian. He is a newspaper man, a columnist, a friend of the great and a friend of the notorious. And among his works that he's authored, by the way, he is an author, uh, Oh, biographies of Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and even Donald Trump. Lord Black has undertaken what has to be his hardest task, I think, and that's issuing the first of his histories of the world. Oh, is that all? Histories of the world. The political and strategic history of the world, volume one, from antiquity to the Caesars, 14 AD is the, the name of his latest book. He starts with the Jews. And he's, uh, I'm up to Pericles, or at least um, I'm hoping to get schooled then soon uh, thereafter uh, on the Peloponnesian War. And um, that should happen ere long. And though I have this book on my e-reader, I will get it in hardback uh, and put it on my bookshelf. It's definitely going to be one of the reference books you'll want to have um, going forward. I know books are sort of passe, aren't they, right? Hardcover books are. But no, they're not. They're becoming even more and more uh, welcoming to a home. And um People need to get them and keep them. I am honored to have him on the Adult in the Room podcast, Lord. Conrad Black, welcome to the Adult in the Room podcast. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, Victoria. Thank you for your intro, which was so flattering. I I didn't really recognize myself, but it's less (laughs) Oh, come on. (laughs) Uh, You've done so many things. And let's start with your title. How does a man from Canada get a British Lord title? I mean, I know you're sort of connected, obviously. The countries are, but... That doesn't always happen, does well, it? Well, I was the, the controlling shareholder of the London Daily Telegraph, which was the l- largest circulation broadsheet newspaper in Europe and certainly in England. And um, it's a tradition in the United Kingdom that the news, the owners of the big newspapers do get peerages. And, uh, and uh, uh, for example, uh, two other Canadians who preceded me in that would be familiar names to you, I think, Lord Beaverbrook and Lord Thompson and, uh, and um, other Commonwealth people uh, have, have uh, that's, that's happened with them too. So, you know, it, it was an ex officio thing, really. I, I mean, they wouldn't appoint you if you were a complete scoundrel, but as long as you're a, you know, responsible person, if you own a big newspaper, it sort of, it happens, you see. The, the British House of Lords is a meritocratic house. O- only a tiny part of it is now um, hereditary. So it, it, you find there uh, the, the the chief rabbi, the leading bishops, the heads of the universities, the heads of the labor unions, the heads of the big corporations, prominent writers like P.D. James was, Yehudi Minuan, the violinist was, and, um, Andrew uh, Lloyd Webber, you know, the man who writes musicals, he's a member of those lords. It, it, it's a, really, it's a very interesting group. And when 
when a serious subject is to be debated, the quality of debate is extremely high. But it's an appointed house, so you can go there as much as as little as you want. Now, really? I, I haven't been active lately because of various distractions I've had, but I, I'm about to go back, you know. I, 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 and I do, I do live in England part of the time, so it's not as if I'm, you know, on the other side of the world and haven't set foot there for 10 years. That is, that's not the case. Do, do you recognize England anymore? Yeah, sure, sure. Of course I do. You are a man of optimism, I have to say, and I'm grateful for that because another question I wanted to ask you was about the problems that we have in uh, North America and southern, just south of uh, Canada, and that would be the United States, and the fact that we seem to be circling the drain um, in values and immigration and all sorts of different Mm -hmm. issues. Can you tell me about what your thoughts are on the prognosis of this country and our well, experiment you know, Adam with democracy. Smith said there's a lot of ruin in a country, and, uh, meaning you really have to make a horrible mess of it for a prolonged time for, for it to go down the drain. So you're, you're nowhere near there. But there is no doubt that there are worrisome things happening. And uh, if, if, if you want um, a brief analysis from me, uh, I'll, I'll try it. But I, I you know, don't want to sound simplistic these are you know it's a very large complicated country and these are very complicated developments but uh, fundamentally i think um uh some of the discordant activity is in a way evidence of the energy and vitality of the country i'll show you what i mean the the united states like all other substantial countries has a mythos you know it has this self-image that it cultivates and uh, all, frankly as i say any serious country and for all i know even the completely unserious ones may do that but you know the french have theirs and the british have theirs and the canadians have theirs and so on but uh, the united states um it, it, it when it was established uh it 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 Unlike the other countries in the world, it didn't have a language of its own. It was the second largest English-speaking country. You know, the French spoke French, and the Dutch spoke Dutch, and the Portuguese spoke Portuguese, and so on. But uh, uh, but uh, the, so the United States announced that it was the country of freedom, of opportunity, of egalitarianism, and uh, and so it was a world nation of opportunity. And as a practical matter, the Americans had no more civil rights after the revolution than they'd had before, or than the British have, or the Swiss, or the Dutch, or most of the Scandinavians, but they had a capital in their own country. And and they did have this tremendous notion of opportunity and meritocracy. And people came in, in huge numbers, initially from Europe and ultimately from all over the place, um, to to join in this opportunity. And when the last rival of the U.S., the last challenge the U.S. faced, simply fell like a souffle, imploded. The Soviet Union disintegrated, let a shot being fired, and and, um, international communism collapsed. After a while, uh, a a sort of counter-complacency set in, and, and for the first time, you could afford the luxury of self-criticism. And as often happens with individuals <laughs> and the institutions, the self-criticism became completely unreasonable. I mean, frankly, uh, the, the old days of, of uh, you know, I have American cousins, and we kind of debate with them at Christmas time, I think, but the old days of the Americans thinking that they were the only free country in the world and, 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 and uh, you know, the, the superior nation in every way, was a little tiresome. I mean, I'm all for patriotism, but it was a little tiresome. But to turn it around the way the wokeists are doing and saying it's an evil and a terrible and a shameful place, and it was an institution uh, really for the promotion of slavery, that was the raison d'etre of the country. This is this is defamation. You're defaming yourself. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, it, in my opinion, it is a kind of last gasp of the pent-up emotions and grievances arising from slavery. And uh, and, and 
you know, it's easy for us in Canada to uh, to look upon this in a detached way because we didn't have slavery. Not, I mean, when the British took over from the French in this country, there were 60 slaves and the French had a way for them to work their way into freedom. 60 slaves, 60. Jeez. Six, oh. and, and, uh, and, and it, w- it was abolished in English Canada in 1791 while it was still a colony. And it was abolished in the entire British Empire in 1832, and we became an independent country in 1867. And the argument for slavery is entirely an economic one, because it was thought that people from Africa were, and this is probably true, but were more efficient at harvesting tropical crops. But you know, we don't have tropical crops in Canada. We don't. We grow a little tobacco near Niagara Falls, but we don't grow any cotton. And so there was never an economic need for it. So no one is in this country that didn't want to come here or their ancestors chose to come here. But you're getting over that. And at the same time, you had this phenomenon that Trump discovered that the economic growth was perceived by the working class and large parts of the ethnic minorities to be something reserved to sort of yuppies and Clinton. <laughs> and, and, and there was a great <laughs> reservoir of discontent there, and he tapped into it, and no one else knew it was there. And, and, it, it, it's, it, it, and I, I think that the attempt to suppress Trump is disgraceful and shocking. I mean, if you indicted the leader of the opposition in this country or in Britain and tried to bankrupt him in a matter where there were no victims and 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 the counterparties in the activities objected to were completely satisfied with the defendant's performance and anxious to do business with him again, uh, if you, you know, it, it, would, it, the, you, it wouldn't work. I mean, the electorate wouldn't stand for it. And I don't uh, think yours will either, by the way. But, I hope not, because uh, this is pretty, uh, this is pretty remarkable. But in one perverse way, the vigor with which the establishment, the Democratic Republican, you know, let's say bipartisan establishment in Washington is fighting the fanaticism with which they're trying to hang on to their position is a sign that it isn't a decadent country. I mean, what they're doing is an outrage, in my opinion, an absolute disgrace and a monstrous affront to your constitution. Yes. But, it, but it, they're not the actions of decadent people who are giving up easily. Uh, you know, they're not going quietly. No. Uh, and so, you know, you, you, you still have a tremendously vital, powerful country. And, and in my opinion, you're just sorting things out. But you're, you're testing the guardrails constitutionally. I mean, the old rules... We've already of, run over the guardrails. Rails. Well, the old rules of thumb were that the courts wouldn't touch the apparent result of a presidential election. Oh. I, I mean, the fact is, the last election... Uh, anybody who looks at it can see where you have 81 million ballots unsolicited sent out on obsolete voters lists. Millions and millions of these ballots come in after the official day of election in, in, in huge lopsided lots into drop boxes with no verification whatever, no scrutinization at all. You don't know who won the election, but you have your suspicions. In an election where 50,000 flipped votes in three states and Trump would have won in the Electoral College, that's why he was annoyed. Now, partly Mm -hmm. he should have been annoyed at himself. He didn't take adequate preparations against this. And he was warning about ballot harvesting, but he didn't do enough. I mean, he's a friend of mine. I have great admiration for Donald, but he, he didn't. That, you know, he's partly himself to blame for this. But but uh, the idea that he was trying to conduct an insurrection, again, is just a, a fantasy. I mean, does anyone imagine that the way any person of, uh, of any stature at all would conduct an insurrection is to have the lunatics wandering around in Wagnerian costumes and nonagenarian swaddled in American <laughs> flags, just <laughs> roaming around in the Congress. That's not the interaction. It's a, we we, we have interviewed uh, Jacob Chansley, by the way. Yeah, that would be the yeah, well, QAnon. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure he's a character, but he's, he's oh. not... You know, Nikolai guy, Lenin, he is, smart. you know, or V.I. Lenin, I should say. But, but um, uh, or you know, or, or Robespierre or something. He's not a real revolutionary, but no. the um, or insurrectionist. But but um, you know who's you, a real yeah, insurrectionist? You know who you know who Robespierre is? I think Leticia James might be the Robespierre. Here she is. She's she's, she's oh, not as smart. Robespierre was a very clever man. 
well, and he somebody... was also a sincere man. He was fanatical. Though. I, I, th- I think she is a is a a sleazy um, and rather stupid person. And uh, and and uh, and she has no stature, whatever. I mean, Robespierre is a, a famous name two hundred years after the fact. I mean, I, obviously, the reign of terror was a bad business, and the Committee of Public Safety was not a good government. But but he was a figure of stature, and and this this woman is just a poltroon, but she's a menace, and yes. it's. It's absolutely shocking to me that the reaction to what she's doing isn't greater than 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 it appears to be. Well, you know, I, I will tell you that part of the reason that the outrage has not been at a you know fever pitch is because there people are out there know that they'll be on an FBI watch list because that's yeah. how much fear has been instilled. Well, you Let know, the, 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 there's a good deal of of rot and you know putrefaction in 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 your system right now, and you've got to root it out. But oh, I, I, uh, if we can just get through to giving the voters a fair shot in the election and making sure that it isn't uh, uh, what we used to call in Quebec a concours de paquetage, which is a ballot stuffing contest, you know, who can stuff more ballots into the box, you know, uh, which is really what we had uh, last election, except mm-hmm. the Republicans weren't weren't good at it, um, or probably didn't even try it. I don't know. But but the uh, if, as long as it's a proper election. I, I, it'll sort out, I think. Well, the, some of these these uh, lists are still bad. These voter lists are still well, bad. Well, they've, 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 they've repaired in... the system in Georgia. And, and as I understand it, there are some genuine reforms in some of the other swing states. As, there are some. And and the Republicans, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've changed party chairman and they're, they're really putting new personnel in. And uh, as I understand it, focusing on this and uh, as, as you know, they they it's catch up football. They have less money than the Democrats and mm-hmm. less experience of this kind of stuff. But but as long as they can make a proper effort in that area, I think it should be fine. I think I'll tell you. May I just comment on the on Please. since you asked me on the polls as they are right now? Sure. I, I just have a comment on that. As, as I see it, the 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 average of the uh, of the polls has Trump leading by two or three points. Um, uh, but that is misleading, in my opinion, because except for Rasmussen and Trafalgar, all the polls uh, that I can see are run by left wing universities uh, or left wing media outlets or a yeah. fusion of the two. Uh, and the real number is three or four points higher than what they give them. And it was in the last election. too. Still within the plus or minus of the. the yeah. Uh, and then if you factor in that the Democrats win California and New York by about 4 million votes more than the Republicans win Texas, Florida, and either Missouri or Tennessee. And the two groups, the two, you know, the two states for the Democrats and the three for Republicans are about the same in electoral numbers, electoral votes. Uh, And so, but 4 million votes, Mm -hmm. plurality for the Democrats. So that's why they can say. That means that in the other 45 states, uh, Trump is leading by about ten percent. Now, I mean, that's you know, that's fifteen, sixteen million votes in an American election. I, this does not look right now to me like that close an election. I think he's going to win easily unless the Democrats can steal it. Well, as a friend of mine says, uh, if it's not close, they can't. I mean, you can't steal what you. No, no, you you can't close. stuff sixteen million ballots. Um, but but yeah, of course they don't need that. They 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 would only need a couple of million in the right places. But but I still don't right. think they can do that. I mean th- they didn't do that last time. I mean there there were there was funny business, but not not I oh. mean not five million votes of funny business. Well, there were more votes than voters in some places. In, in, in a few places, yeah. No, in yeah. parts of Wisconsin, there were, for instance, yes, state absolutely. that they won by ten thousand. Um, uh, Arizona was an awful one too. You know, they won there by ten thousand. What uh, two weeks after the election? Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's. We need to go back to having an election day, and I'm afraid. Well, yeah, and a uh, paper ballot, and you know, I, th- I, you know, a friend of mine who's in in the 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 world of um, election integrity says that uh, computer ballots or c- computers count ballots more efficiently and yes. effectively than do humans. 
But I think it would make people feel a lot better if there was somebody's hand touching a ballot to determine whether or not signatures matched and that sort of thing. And it would be nice to just go back and stop this this er, super early voting and late voting. I mean, that was just well, where it goes. The vote election day goes on for 30 days. Yeah. But the, um, no, I will say it's sort of impressive, though, it, you know, the, the the total vote jumps between. Eight o'clock Eastern time and eight oh five, it jumps by forty million votes. It's kind of yeah. awesome in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see things immediately when we used to go back to counting ballots on the day, or you know, counting ballots as they came in. And uh, look, I, I remember the nineteen six era, which is another one. I mean, Nixon might just as well have won that election for all we know. And President Eisenhower asked him to contest and he said no it'd be bad for the country in the cold war i won't do it right. he's a very patriotic man mr nixon yes you know, but he oh absolutely I, that's admit richard nixon's one of my favorite hobby horses watergate's one of my favorite hobby horses on the podcast because i i really wanted to do over in the coverage of watergate and a man who's actually written a game a book about it I was just looking at it, as a matter of fact, Postgate, former federal prosecutor who's gone through all of the coverage. He was Deep Throat's attorney, so he had access beyond the average bear of some of the uh, Well, does he d- does he say, as I do, and I don't know if you saw my book on Mr. Nixon, but... That, I that, haven't read it yet, but I will. Uh, that, that, that there is no evidence that Mr. Nixon himself committed any crime. Oh, ab- uh, Jeff Schaefer's book... Um, yeah, I've read that. That's I think he's very good, Sheffer. Yeah. Sheffer. Well, this uh, this uh, this gentleman, uh, John O'Connor, has gone through the coverage and what the Post knew. Here, this goes forensically. What the Post knew, the information it had at the time it reported. It went through journalistically how they came up came to have the information, what they reported, and what they chose not to report. And what they chose not to report was the CIA involvement in the actual first Watergate break-in, which I find a serious uh, problem with the coverage. And then they gave it short shrift after now, that. Were Helms and Vernon Walters aware of that? Uh, Helms was because, Helms, and I, I've asked another guy I've had on the show, <laughs> Sam Faddis, who was in CIA. I said, hey, you know, what about the CIA involvement in Watergate? And, and uh, why is it that they, you know, <clears throat> CIA didn't come to the rescue of the president or at least gave him a lifeline, just something. And he goes, because... Richard Nixon pissed him off. I mean, that's really what basically happened. He didn't use those words, obviously, but, 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 you know, but I mean, he said, you know, they I had a choice. Do it. You know, I interviewed both both Richard Helms and Vernon Walters, who was a neighbor of mine in Palm Beach. Oh, and wow. I knew him quite well. And um, they both said to me they had no evidence that Nixon had committed a crime. No. And, and, uh, the uh, supposed uh, problems on the tape and where he uh, well, John Dean was that the cancer on the presidency because it was John Dean's. Uh, he was op- a disgrace. That man He's a disgrace. A and, disgrace. and the yeah, way he's... Martin Sheehan, and these others have tried to turn him into a, a hero. He was the the vintage in all of American history. He was the ultimately loathsome squealer. I mean, he yeah. did, uh, one thing to squeal, something else to make it up and squeal. Right. That's right. He didn't. Richard Nixon didn't know about the uh, break in. He didn't know about the security aspects. And, and of, when he said give uh, uh, Howard Hunt some money, he right. didn't say in exchange for lying under oath. Let him <laughs> make sure he can pay his legal bills. His wife was just killed in a plane crash. I yeah. mean, are we are, have we got some sympathy here or what? Well, That's and then how. Ha- Howard Hunt. Let's see. Wh- Howard Hunt was Howard Hunt was the, the mole of the CIA in the White House. And 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 he look. I don't want to pick on him. I think what happened to him was unfortunate. I think he was basically a well-intentioned person, but he he was protected by his friends, like my friend Bill Buckley. Uh, mm-hmm. But his role in that whole thing was a pretty shabby business, and he, he basically dumped. You know, it's the old the whole plea bargain thing. They all just dumped it upwards to the you know yeah, ultimately to the top. They always say BS goes rolls downhill, but. It- no, not in this case. And then Richard Nixon took it like a man. Uh, he, he that he did, and and I, I knew him well in his last five years. He was a very, he was a a brilliant man and a good man, and and an outstanding president. And the uh, Washington Post insert. Look, I, I like Kay Graham personally. She was always very kind to me when I was mm. starting out as a publisher. Uh, she was a nice lady, but she has a lot to answer for. And and as for old um, Ben Bradley. Yeah, I, he was he was a scoundrel. 
I mean, he, he'd be what he was a, a charming scoundrel up to a point, but he was a dangerous man in that position. He had well, no right. at all, in my opinion. Bob Woodward, a, 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 an assassin, a bloodless assassin, and Bernstein's even worse. They're Bernstein's a greaser. I mean, they're a disgrace. Those two. They've Maybe. they've been living off this uh, off this absolute fraud they perpetrated now for fifty years. They still infest our TV screens. They come on, you know, on, you know the anti-Trump channels all the time, saying, you know, that this this is worse than Nixon. And when you get occasionally on anniversaries and stuff, they write a joint article reminding everybody of the horrors of Watergate, and it is such utter nonsense. I mean, Victoria, have you read the articles of impeachment that they worked up against Nixon? You know, I don't think no, I, I, don't... I mean, no, nobody of sound mind would take any of it seriously that that nixon um uh, uh, uh endeavored to, to persuade people not to cooperate well in in fact in the end they did cooperate they didn't say that he did he didn't cooperate they said he endeavored to persuade others not to cooperate uh, but they cooperated well, anyway well what you throw him out of office <laughs> are you crazy well, he had it in his head that he didn't want them to cooperate. So they were able to divine from the wrinkles on his forehead what he was thinking about. Therefore, they. No, you know, it, it, it was it was a crucifixion. It was, it was that, in my opinion. And here, you know, I, I once had dinner with the late Ted Williams. And I'm no great sports. Wow. Fan, but when I was a kid, he and Rocket Richard, I'm from Montreal, the. Montreal Canadiens hockey team were my two great heroes. You see, I mean, this is when I was twelve years old, and so I had dinner with them. And I and and, and the former commissioner of baseball, Faye Vincent, was there, and he said, well, "You know, what were your best and worst moments?" So he said in baseball, you know, various things. And he said, "But if you mean not just in baseball, but in my life, but my greatest moment was receiving the Navy Cross as a combat Marine pilot." in World War II in Korea. And my worst moment was what we as a country did to Dick Nixon. He said, because of my position, it's been my privilege to know every president from Roosevelt to Clinton, who was the president at the time. And next to Roosevelt and Eisenhower, Dick Nixon was the most impressive. And what we did to him was an absolute shameful, disgraceful thing. And I think he was right. The story needs to be told and people need to shout it from the rooftops and people are trying and, and have been, that's why I've no, done, I've done my part right? and the Nixon mm -hmm. library recommends my book. Oh, really? That's wonderful. Yeah. I, I used to be a docent at the Nixon library. That's when I lived in Southern California just a few years ago, it was the closest presidential library. And I go, well, you know, he wasn't my favorite president, but I'll go and, and see if they want me. And they did. They took me on as a docent and I did tours and all the low level stuff that we docents do. And, yeah. and I gained a, a huge appreciation for him. Yeah, huge. Good, yeah. And, and uh, well, uh, it, it's again, it's in a way it's sort of his posthumous victory, isn't it? Because ultimately they won those lawsuits. I mean, they did a complete mm -hmm double cross on them they made a deal like they make with all these presents hand over your papers and we'll give you the tax treatment for it that happens to all of them that's yeah, how yeah, Roosevelt yeah. set it up you know it was, it was fine it's, it's fine it's good and and um and then they said no we're not going to do that we're, we're not we're taking the papers back and and uh so you know he litigated and he you know he set up his own library with, with his own financial support no government assistance and opened it. And then finally, I think he won the big lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And they said, all right, all right, we're, we'll move all your papers in there. But his literary executors have more authority over his library than any of the other president's families. Go back, started with Hoover. Oh. I mean, it's, Roosevelt did it, but the only ex president alive at the time was Hoover. I mean, Roosevelt did his usual, I mean, he, he, he did a pretty good number, too, you see. He built the library towards the end of his second term on the theory he was retiring. But guess what? He had his fingers crossed behind his back, and he was elected two more times, and he used his library while he was, while he was the president. Wow. Hmm. Well, well, I just remember some of the old-timers at the library, uh, some of the old-timer docents and such, when NARA came in, National Archives, for which I have very little um, 
respect at this point after this whole well, as with after this document. business at Mar-a-Lago. How could yeah, you unbelievable. I mean, they just went down several rungs in my esteem, but they were upset about the the National Archives taking over the Nixon Library, even though they made it a heck of a lot better looking and that sort of thing, because they were just um, they uh, big footed everybody. And yeah. they, you know, the, the Watergate, now that I look back and know what I know about Watergate, they had none of the information about the CIA there. And they should. I mean, if you want to tell the right story, tell them why the CIA was the first one to go to the DNC and break in so that they could tap the phone to find out how many people of all political persuasions, but obviously that was in the DNC, were taking advantage of the cat house a couple of doors down and why John Dean's girlfriend was best friends with the madam of that house of ill repute that they the call girl. Of. Wait, is it, are you referring to Mo Dean? I'm, lo- I'm of course I'm referring to Mo Dean. She, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I just the, the way the everyone involved on the other side was beatified. Absolutely atrocious. In and, retrospect, and they, were, they were a gang of absolute scum. Yeah. And then I mean, as the English would say, filth. That's now here's were. here's what I want to find out from you. I mean, a, a million things I want to find out from you. But you know. fire when ready, Gridley. <laughs> to what extent does the intelligence world have influence on newspapers because clearly the CIA and the D the uh, DNC they had a deal going and the Washington Post was also the, the Washington Post was the official mouthpiece of the DNC okay that's that the Democratic New, Party New York Times was sort of co mouthpiece I'd say but yeah you're right and so to what extent do they have influence on the news media when you were well, running you see I, the in the only large paper we had in the U.S. was the Chicago Sun-Times. They didn't have any there. Zero. And um, uh, they had been able to, the Democrats had been able to count on the Sun-Times in the past. But, but that's because Marshall Field was the owner, the department store owner, and he was the owner and he was a Democrat. And, um, and, and he was fighting Colonel McCormick, who was a fanatical Republican, so the Democrats supported him. But I, as far as I know, it was traditional partisanship of a very vehement kind, but nothing dishonorable by anybody, in, I, including, I can... including okay, not even... McCormick, the owner of the Tribune. But, but, so, uh, so... Oh, go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, now, if you mean in general, the only time... Um, we had any relationship with an intelligence operation was in, in Britain uh, in respect of Northern Ireland. And they would come and give me briefings every quarter. And uh, so I knew what was happening. And they would tell me areas that we, we, we just couldn't be publicized. But, uh, but there's nothing wrong with this. These were legitimate, uh, you know, human protection and security matters, not partisan matters at all. Uh, there was never a hint of partisanship, nothing like that. It was just, we've got to watch this and that because we have informants there. And, uh, you know, the, they, the, the, it got sort of complicated, but they, the, they had completely infiltrated the, the Protestant, um, uh, I won't call them terrorists, but, you know, the, so the Protestant counter to the IRA. Then they, they, they got pretty rough too, you see. And, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but 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 the, the, it, it, so I knew this, but obviously we didn't put it in the paper. But that was I, in, in my, I never I was always on the lookout to see if they were asking me to cover up misconduct by the government or anything like that. Never. Not a trace of it. They just wanted to make sure that we didn't accidentally put people's lives at risk, uh, you know, because obviously the, the fewer people that got killed, the better. And sure. uh and ultimately, it was all you know. They pretty well sorted it all out now, finally. But, uh, but, but uh, they, that that was straight. I was MI six and the, you know domestic military intelligence in the UK. Very so, professional operation. No nonsense at all. Well, you know, maybe it's, it's, you always wonder because now that we know what we know. You know well, look, the FBI in should, be, in my opinion, just be abolished. I think it's a disgrace. <laughs> in the trials I had, uh, it, it, we it, they did nothing but lie. Every contribution they made to the case was exposed as a lie, and they and that it wasn't even intelligent takedowns. It, it was palookas. I mean, dunderheads, absolute, 
uh, as you say, big footed dunderheads lumbering around and bumping into each other. And when they were dumb enough to call them as witnesses, we tore them limb from limb. Uh, 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 it was pathetic. I mean, say what you will about J. Edgar Hoover. In the immortal words of Mr. Nixon, he was a good police chief. I mean, he didn't meddle in presidential elections. So they've meddled in uh, the best we can figure. They've meddled in the 2016, 2020, 2024. Uh, uh, Obviously, you can uh, see uh, the, the narrative forming right now as well, we look speak. At, look at Comey's record now. A man who... 245 times said under oath, uh, I don't recall, referring to events that had happened within the last two years. Mm-hmm. To, I yeah. mean, you remember how pompous and self-righteous he was? Yes. And, yes. and, and he, he's now uh, basically in the closet, you know, a very tall closet for <laughs> tall people. But uh, uh, I mean, he, he never appears and no one, absolutely nobody can cite him seriously. Um, so you and Trump have had similar problems with the judicial system. We'll explain that because you talked about it when I was uh, fill in the blank. But and I want you to talk about that because it actually um, uh, informs a lot of what, how you see things these days as well. But if we may, can we go back to 2013? I believe it is when uh, 2012, 2013, when you conducted an interview with Donald Trump. Do you have any thoughts about whether you would play a political role at any level going forward? I mean, you'd be a very strong candidate for mayor, for example. Well, as you know, I've had a good time with politics over the years, over many years, and uh, did very well when I was thinking about running. I decided not to do it because I have a lot of other obligations, including a very, very successful show. And as you know, you have equal time provisions, which don't allow me to do what I'd like to do. But I, I do stay involved in politics very strongly. I feel very strongly the nation's in serious trouble. Our nation is really in serious trouble. And we'll see what happens over the years. But I do very much love politics. I was leading in every poll. I really enjoyed what I was doing. But ultimately, I decided not to run. I was very shocked to see how poorly Mitt did. He's a fine man, a nice man. But unfortunately, he didn't resonate with the public and with the voters. And Obama won. See, that seems like a measured guy. We don't see much of that guy on the on the campaign trail. What do you think of Donald Trump? Um, uh, first of all, I did, uh, you, it startled me there to hear him say what high opinion he had of Mitt Romney. Um, <laughs> uh, no, look, I, I, I he's a loyal friend. You know, he's a loyal friend. I, I, I would say first of all, and uh, when you go through the kind of crisis I did uh, that's the highest quality you can find and the rarest one to find um, uh, but in the abstract just as a person he's uh, he is um, he is a, a, a very extraordinary person uh, first of all he's a, a charming man personally to have him to dinner or something he, uh, he, he contrary to I think widespread impressions. Uh, he he listens carefully. Doesn't talk over anybody. He's a marvelous raconteur. I, I think that's not a surprise. I think people would would understand that. Uh, and he's really a very interesting person. Uh, he's uh, he's extremely intelligent, but very intuitive. Uh, he, he, he's, he's not someone who has always at his fingertips, huge number of facts, but he is someone who has a piercing insight into what people want and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And I used to discuss this with my late friend, Henry Kissinger, who, who was prepared to fear the worst about Donald Trump in foreign policy matters, but quickly found that. He had an extraordinarily quick grasp of what different people, like the German Chancellor, what she would, Angela Merkel at the time, what she wanted to do and, and, and what the Achilles heel in her position was. And, and Trump had figured that out very quickly. And other, I just cite her as one, but other people as well. And um, uh, I think, I think 
we, I think he has a number of outstanding qualities. He's decisive, he's fearless. And, and when he concludes that something is the best thing to do, he does it and, and is never worried uh, about, uh, you know, breaking, you know, breaking pottery on the way through. Um, <laughs> An example was moving the embassy in Jerusalem. And from Eisenhower on, people were either hinting that they would do it or outright promising they would do it, and then they didn't do it. Right. And he said, well, yeah, of course it should be in Jerusalem, and he moved the embassy. And the, the, the life went on, you know, it wasn't the end of the world. And um, uh, I, I would say, I just, I would, can I just make a couple of points about him that wouldn't naturally come to mind, I think. And one is, I, I put it to you and to your viewers, that except for those presidents who were vital in founding the country and its institutions, that would be Washington, Jefferson, and Madison, and those presidents who successfully commanded great armies in just wars, I'm talking here about Grant and Eisenhower. We're not talking about the Mexican War or something like that. Grant and Eisenhower. Um, except for them, and conceivably Herbert Hoover because of his relief work in Europe at the end of World War I and building a worldwide engineering company. Apart from those six, if you include Hoover, Trump achieved more before he was president than anyone else who has held that office. He made billions of dollars as a quality builder in one of the toughest markets in the world, principally, but some, some elsewhere, but mainly in New York. And, and, and he, he decided one fine day he wanted to become a television star. He invented a form of television. I mean, I personally didn't watch it. It's not the kind of thing that would interest me, but, but you know, different strokes for different folks. But he led the ratings every Tuesday night for 14 years, except one night when Dancing with the Stars had some astounding <laughs> celebrity on it. And, and uh, you know, people, millions of people over the years go to Hollywood and toil as waitresses and janitors trying to become stars. And fine, Trump was a rich man, but he had the idea. He took a half ownership with NBC, set it up, came out of the gate and led the ratings for 14 years, 50 weeks a year. 14 years in a row. And, and then he devised this technique of, I mean, you know, he, he, he devised a technique for becoming president that everybody laughed at, but was a, a complete genius analysis. He counted on celebrity and name recognition. He polled constantly. He changed parties seven times in 13 years waiting for his moment. He's like a lion hunting a wildebeest or something. And then he <laughs> saw, he didn't want to run against an incumbent president. So when Obama retired, he could see the Republican nomination was open. He came down the escalator with Melania. Everybody in the late night humor business, not that I found many of them very funny, uh, were splitting their sides laughing, falling down their own stairs laughing at the thought of Trump running for president. Of course, he was elected, and and he was a good president. And and once in his president, he had a further stroke of genius, which was to uplift uh, the old country club Republican Party and transplant it on top of the low-income districts of America and win over those districts by the application of traditional... Dwight Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, re Republican capitalism. He, he gave tax breaks to people who employed people in poor districts. And, and lo and behold, um, African-American and Hispanic voters and working class white voters started to flow to the, to the Republicans. And, and the, in the hysteria of, of the bipartisan establishment being routed out of their out of their flesh pots in Georgetown and been put to work for the first time <laughs> you know since Roosevelt and Truman's day they, they uh, you know that they, they stole an election on them. and 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 they 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 thought they'd outsmarted everybody 
by putting an absolute cipher in on top of Sanders' socialist program. The program's been a disaster. The cipher is obviously completely inadequate to his office, and 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 they are, are they, yeah they are in a glide path to total destruction, and they deserve. Well, that's why I ask. You know, you, <laughs> you 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 have looked at empire upon empire upon empire in your book, your yeah. history. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wonder about. We're losing the rule of law. There's an assault on private property rights. The U.S. Supreme Court appears to have a problem. Look, with I have, I, Victoria, I've got to tell you, your your legal system has been very defective for a long time. Right. I mean, you've got a 98 percent conviction rate in federal cases. That isn't a legal system. It's just a conveyor belt of the prison system. I mean, in 61 percent in, in Canada and 50 percent in Britain. And not because our prosecutors are incompetent. It's because the defendants have a chance. Mm hmm. So tell me about your experience, if you don't mind going over those old. Well, look, it's work. it's your it's your um, um, uh, you, I've, God, I keep forgetting the word for it, but the uh, the the system Perhaps. whereby the um, <laughs> an accused will roll over naming other people. Oh, yeah. And, uh, it's the evidence. Cooperating witness thing, but the, there's a phrase for it that I forget at the moment, but I'll, I'll remember it in a moment. But, you know, what, what you ha have is so let's say they went after you. Oh, so God, yeah. they go to the six people closest to you in whatever activity it is they're objecting to. And they say, look here, you know, uh, Ms. Taft, uh, you, uh, you know that these uh, crimes have been committed. You must know something about it. We're not accusing you, but we do expect you to cooperate and provide evidence for us. So your friends say, that's not true at all. I've known her for a long time. She's a very honest person. There must be some mistake here. And they say, oh, well, all right, if that's how you want to play it, then there is a conspiracy to obstruct justice and you're part of it, so we're indicting you too. But, um, <laughs> but if you can uh, jog your memory to overcome this inconvenient amnesia you're suffering from and produce useful evidence for us, we will not only not prosecute you, we will give you a guarantee against a perjury prosecution. So this is just a straight incentivization of invented false evidence. And, 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 that's, and that's what you get. So, uh, it, you know, the defendant is sitting there. His six closest friends are frog marched in, uh, spew and deluge of lies on the court under oath, condemning him for crimes he didn't commit, which they know he didn't commit. And, 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 and he, you know, he's a dead pigeon. Well, that isn't justice, but that's how it works. I mean, if I'm, if British or well, I'm not saying, by the way, that the British or Canadian systems are perfect. They are. No system is. But if British or Canadian prosecutors did that, they'd be disbarred. I, I don't mean just sacked as prosecutors. They'd be out. They'd be right out of the profession. I, 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 but you're going to convict everybody that way. Well, that isn't justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, by all means, let's convict people who are guilty. And sometimes mistakes happen. But if the prosecutors can take down anyone then then it, it, you're, it, it's, a, it's a terrible problem. Well, so your, your legal issues in the United States had to do with uh, selling of your, your companies, or if I'm not mistaken, and they took umbrage with how you did that or whatever, sort of like the way I feel that um, some people perceive President Trump's... No, I, uh, I, the numbers were in question. The, the, um, what they objected to was... Um, receiving non-compete payments but these were little papers in little towns and, and and we knew the people in those towns if so if we'd sold the paper and then phoned up the five main advertisers in these little towns and said look we'll give you 50 percent of this new paper we're starting uh, and we'll guarantee we'll circulate it to every household in the you know in the in the area uh the what we just sold would have been worthless you know so the guys yeah. who the newspapers it would have been worthless they're always non-competes and things like that and and um and and, and we we won almost all the counts even though it's such an awful system but but uh in the end i was convicted of uh and look the supreme court vacated the count but in this odd american manner it was sent back to the lower court 
uh, with the admonition for that court to contemplate the gravity of its errors. And the late Madam Justice Ginsburg, who wrote the opinion for the United Court, unanimous court, one, one recusal. I mean, the former Solicitor General couldn't, couldn't judge it perfectly right. But the, the other eight were unanimous. Uh, Justice Ginsburg wrote the judgment, and, and she condemned what she called the infirmity of invented law. I mean, for judges, well, that's that pretty good for language. her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and and, uh, and so it went it went back, and and they um, they they retrieved against me one count mm -hmm. of improperly receiving two hundred and eighty five thousand dollars. Um, and, and yet that $285,000 was part of a large capital gain on a sale. It had been approved by the independent directors and it had been published in our filings, our public filings and our filings with the SEC twice. I'm like, what had I done? What was wrong with that? Nothing. That's what was wrong with it. But that's what that is in the end what I was stuck with. And and when this whole thing went, Alan Dershowitz was acting for me and went, I mean, in the after trial part and uh, and, and took it to the uh, White House law office, Pat Cipollone. And they and, and the White House le legal team went through it carefully. And, the, and they said that these people should never have been charged. This is bunk. It's nonsense. And then that's that's what the president's pardon said. It wasn't a it wasn't a pardon of look, uh, he, this guy's a good man. He made a mistake, but he paid for it. Let's pardon him. It was th this never should have happened. He, these guys shouldn't have been charged. I mean, my co-defendants were pardoned also, whom whom Donald did not know. He had no idea, who, you know, anything about them. So, what do you think of uh, the, what he's going through now, legally speaking, by the uh, law? Unspeakable. Crowd? I mean, just utterly unspeakable. That a serious country that still, as far as I can see, considers itself something of an example to be uh, emulated and respected in, in terms of a society of laws, would actually do this to uh, the principal figure in the opposition in an election year. Uh, the, 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 this is not democracy. It is not justice. It is not the rule of law. And it is a mortal threat to America's status as a constitutional republic. Now, if it goes on and is successful, the United States will still be a very powerful country. That's not the issue. But it will have no standing whatsoever to speak as the leader of the democracies. You know, Jimmy Carter might even come to our country and want to observe the elections. Yeah, sure. Sure. Look, I, in this, here in Canada, uh, I, I, I say we should cancel our extradition treaty with the U.S., we're just sending people to prison, you know, and we're not, we shouldn't extradite people to countries that don't have a reasonably fair criminal justice system. On the day or on the week that we're talking and conducting this interview, Letitia James, um, oh, Donald Trump was unable to get almost a half a billion dollars in uh, bond money that he has to put up in order to appeal the outrageous charges against him and the conviction thereof in his uh, case in which uh, no one got snookered, no one got cheated. Uh, there was no crime except that which they made up or decided to regurgitate an old law to apply to Donald Trump, which is what they also did with the uh, E.G. Carroll case. What do you make of that? I mean, that's, that's, we're getting to the end of no, it's it's an absolute, discourse. Um, it's an absolutely evil development. Nothing less than that. I mean, you have you have a situation where he produced valuations for assets pledged in respective loans. The the loan agreements were completely honored. The loans were entirely repaid with full interest. The lenders came into his trial and said, without a single exception that they were delighted to have done business with him. He, it was perfectly fair, above board, and correct. And their own valuations didn't markedly differ from his. Mm. And, and yet this kangaroo court and this ghastly posturing, preening little judge, and it's a Mickey Mouse court to begin with, shouldn't be trying a case of this quantum, um, 
uh, uh, hammered it down as a colossal offense with an award of nearly half a billion dollars as a penalty. And, and the perversity of the system requires uh, posting a bond even larger than the penalty number to have the right to appeal. In my opinion, it, it is in clear violation of the Bill of Rights. I mean, the Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments guarantee due process, no seizure of property with a just payment, an impartial jury, um, due process fine. at every level, prompt justice, reasonable bail. Almost none of those elements were present in that case. I would have thought, now I'm, God help, I mean, in theory, I'm a lawyer, but good luck to anyone taking their advice from me legally, including myself, which I'm too smart to do that myself. Um, but as my reading, the, 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 he has a very, he has a very strong appeal to get this out of the rinky dink New York courts and to the Supreme Court on the Bill of Rights arguments. And in addition to that, I think it would weigh heavily in the minds of the justices of the Supreme Court that at play here were issues that went fundamentally to the stability and, and the credibility of the United States Constitution and government as a working example of the rule of law. I mean, what is going on here is not the rule of law. It, it is outright despotism. I don't see anybody standing on the rooftops yelling that. Any judges, there aren't, you know, you don't see John Roberts. I know I recognize him. Yeah, he's, he's a the dumb. politician. Though. In fairness to him, and I, he's not my, uh, I mean, I, I, I like chief justices who take a stand better, you know. Um, I, the, the, the only two that I knew were Rehnquist and Berger, and I, they, they were a little more forceful than, than this mm -hmm. guy. But, uh, um, but you know, I, I, I perfectly understand. He's the chief justice. This may come to me. He shouldn't be speaking about it in public. I can't fault him for that. And I think it will get to him, and I think he, he will do the right thing. Uh, I mean, my impression is that they... I mean, if you look back on it, and this aggravated Trump even more than what the Democrats did, there were 19 lawsuits in respect to the 2020 election, and and um, uh, and none of them. I mean, the, the constitutionality of the voting and voting rights changes. I don't mean Rudy Giuliani's nonsense, but right. one aggrieved voter in Pennsylvania, so chuck the whole election and so on. I, I, I mean, laws passed in the swing states that were unconstitutional and, 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 and were not approved by the state legislatures, right. which the Constitution requires. And the, the, the one that had with the opening arguments were in the Supreme Court was the Texas Attorney General joined by 19 other attorney generals in, of the states against the swing states for not for failing in their obligation to conduct honest presidential elections within their states. And, and, and Alito sort of dissented from the refusal to hear it. But the, the, the court just said no dice. We're not hearing it. Now, mm. I, I, I understand that what was in their mind was if we overturn the election, the whole system's going to blow up. Well, but, they're just going to get 2000 election for, you know, now it's going to be the 2020 election. That's, you know, we haven't heard the end of the 20. No, no, uh, no, no. But I, I, I think this time. Um, look, I, again, I have, I have the impression that, you know, they they accepted the nonsensical argument that um, that Obamacare was 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 a tax, which but just because <laughs> if they, if they tossed out Obamacare. The friction between between the the bench and the Democratic Party would be too fierce, and and they're trying to protect the court. Um, and yeah, instead of our rights. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the problem with a system where the judiciary isn't completely separated as it should be. And um, uh, and then the the uh, I, you know I, I think that they. They 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 give away the little things to the Democrats because I think in their minds 
Roberts and the five who are more reliable than he is are, are and know that it's quite likely they are going to have to lower the boom on the shenanigans of the Democrat system, but they'll have to do it before the election. They yeah. can't do it before the election. They should have taken and the Pennsylvania case. They look the other guardrail, by the way, which I have just sailed right through it like a you know double trailer truck, ninety miles an hour, it is you know into the cavern below. Is the um, uh, is, is is the business you don't harass ex presidents? I mean, Jerry Ford was finally awarded uh, the the Profiles in Courage Medal, so named after the book Ghost Written for JFK by James McGregor Burns. Uh, I mean, I admire JFK, but that he I, I, I think his contribution to that book was about an hour, you know, uh, and and um, it was a silhouette on the front. And they gave Gerald Ford this award for pardoning Mr. Nixon. Uh, and 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 I, I mean, I th I thought when Ford did it, you know, what a fine, decent, strong man he is. He wasn't fast in his feet. He wasn't charismatic. He was a decent, strong, honest man. And I didn't know him quite well eventually, and that, and that confirmed my view of him. Wow. Wow. So you've come through the fire of the judicial system, and so has a friend of another friend of yours, Mark Stein. Y yes. Could yes, you tell me a little bit about Mark Stein, how he's doing? I understood that he argued his own case in Washington, D.C. Well, and, he spent $5 you know, million we'll... dollars and he didn't have any more money, but he gave a wonderful argument. Yeah. I was on, my wife and I went on his uh, cruise. You know, I was a so-called resource on his cruise. And, uh, you know, needless to say, these things are completely hilarious, you know. But, um, um he's 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 had a couple of heart attacks so he, he but he looks well he looks fine he speaks well but he's in a wheelchair at the moment he can walk a bit but not very far and you know these big cruise ships they're uh, you know they're thousand feet long so if you go around them a bit you're walking quite a lot you know it was very good you know, if you've got a soft soled shoes very good for someone like me to walk around in the deck or something get some mm -hmm. fresh air and things but um uh, but 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 he's so he's he's convalescing, he's recuperating, but he's mm -hmm. fine, and um, he uh, he thinks that uh, he thinks he will be able to appeal and get it reduced. I mean, it was an utterly spurious decision, and and uh, you understand his his opponent didn't pay a cent of his own legal fees. It was all they extracted as testimony. Um, from witnesses, uh, for, and in this case, from the plaintiff himself, that um, he hadn't he hadn't spent a cent of his uh, on legal fees. It was all done by these uh, by the climate change industry and trying mm -hmm. to sell this myth that we're you know we're all going to be swimming for our lives in seven years if we don't uh, all live under thatch and take carpools and bicycle from here to Alaska every year or something. And <laughs> and um, uh, he he believes he will get it reduced. Uh, there are also a lot of supporters of his who would help him with the fine. And uh, million dollars. His, his morale is fine. His morale is. Oh, fine. that's good. Well, he supposedly defamed Michael Mann, who is the impossible to defame him. He's such a such a. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, the way that that worked out for Michael Mann was you said he didn't put forward at one penny of his own money. And it sounds to me as if they're the same kind of lot who uh, bankrolled E. Jean Carroll's uh, yeah. lawsuit against yes. Trump. And, and uh, you know, you get the lawfare crowd on the left and Mark Elias is shot calling for him. And, you know, hey, we've got I, to hand it to Elias. He, he's sort of the. He's kind of the devil in the basement at the moment, I and mean, he seems to be organizing all of this stuff. Yeah. But um, uh, two can play that game, you know, and that, that's the danger the Democrats have, because that's all they have. They don't have anything except dirty tricks. They have a completely incompetent administration, a totally unfeasible president, an equally unfeasible vice president, uh, you know, a, 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 a Senate majority leader who is... Uh, you done is he even out Biden and harassed those two the originals but with <laughs> by sticking his foot into the bear trap of intra Jewish matters like this I mean it's it's just I, I the only person in the leadership of the Democrats that strikes me as having an IQ and even double figures is Jeffries 
but I don't like him. He seems to be, to be sort of a clever man. Hakeem Jeffries, the yeah. speaker in waiting for the Democrats. Yeah, I, he, I think he's going to have a good long wait for that one. Be like Joe Martin, you know, wasn't he the Republican leader for what? Oh, go on. Fourteen years before he became the speaker. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, because I know I'm, I've uh, pretty much run up against the bumper bumpers of the uh, time that we've asked for. Um, you've come across some pretty interesting and, and notorious figures, uh, you know, heroes and villains in your time as uh, in all of the things you've done and mm. in your newspaper life. Did you ever come, come across uh, Robert Maxwell? Knew him well. Really? Yes. Was, now, is, is it true in your estimation that he was a CIA or a Mossad guy? Not CIA. I, I think he would have certainly cooperated with Mossad if asked. He was, in my opinion, a sincere Jew and a sincere supporter of Israel. He, he's buried in Jerusalem. Yes, so. yes. Yeah, on the Mount of Olives, I believe. Wow. Hmm. Um, so you knew him. So you, you didn't, you know, he's made out to be a real bad individual. And... Well, he, uh, he, uh, you couldn't believe a word he said. I mean, he was a colorful <laughs> character. I mean, I, super... I, I, I sort of liked him in a way, but but he was a scoundrel. Uh-huh. I mean, a complete scoundrel. You know, he before I knew him, and the reason he became so notorious was he 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 arranged a contract to supply school books to to a, a major province of the country of Nigeria. So these school books were delivered. And they were blank books. They had no printing in them. And and uh, but you know, the there were some, obviously some complaints about this. But he'd given a one to see him as a bribe to whoever signed the deal on the other side. And, uh, and he became frightfully self-righteous and said, oh, it's rubbish. It's all you know, some mistakes in there, you know. And, and uh, it, I mean, he was an egregious character, but he was, uh, he, he was, he was he very amusing, I must say. I mean, I remember, may I tell a little story about him? <laughs> Please do. <clears throat> he, he had what he called his council house, which in England is a house owned by the municipality. You get it's like really assisted housing, you see, like poor people might live in it. So he had this very large house just outside the university city of Oxford. And and it was technically owned by the regional council of Oxfordshire, but on a long lease, you see. Yeah, I mean, he had a long lease on it. So he invited me up to dinner and in his dining room, all of one wall was, was a very elaborate dinner service, it, 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 obviously extremely fine porcelain so towards the end of proceedings i said uh, well, well there must be a story to the the dinner service there he said yes there is uh at the end of world war ii i was in the uh you know, he was a captain they always called him captain bob he's like i was a captain and in the uh, um, occupation of british occupation british zone of berlin so i i would go around with some of my lads and we would uh, requisition things. I said, you mean pillage? And he said, well, yes. As if I was, you know, I, but I, I said, the fact that your orders didn't allow for that would not be a real impediment then, Bob. He said, look here, the Nazis murdered my parents. I didn't give a damn what the orders were. I was going to take what I wanted from the goddamn Germans. I said, oh, that's fine. So um, we, I can, anyway, I one can fine hear. day, my, you know, they were... <laughs> Take, they were extracting this dinner service from a rather grand house in a suburb of Berlin. Uh, and, um, and, and unknown to us, we had ventured into the French zone. So a French colonel arrived and uh, said to me, uh, what are you doing, Captain, in French? And I replied in French. And he put it in French, but I'm from Quebec, so I speak French, so I could get what he was doing, you see. And he said... Um, well, I'm I'm just um, taking this dinner service, requisitioning it. He said, "Well, you're in the French zone, Captain, so I suggest you put it back." And um, Bob said, "Colonel, I think I have a better idea. Why don't you designate someone, and we will divide it in half, and I will take care of one half, and the rest will be delivered to your attention anywhere you want in the Western Three Allied zones." 
the colonel said, I think that's an excellent idea. <laughs> so there, you know, I mean, it, to, to Bob, this was just normal business, you see. But the, oh, the, the way he said it, the uh, air of absolute entitlement with which he described a fairly serious breach of orders, which he could have actually been, I mean, I doubt if they would have court-martialed them, but they certainly would have reprimanded them. And and, and you getting reamed out by Field Marshal Montgomery wouldn't have been any any fun, believe me. No. Uh, and, and um, you know, he just, this is how it goes. You know, he was a, he was a scoundrel, but uh, but I sort I sort of liked him. But he was he was he was dangerous. You know, I mean, he he he, he, he kept starting these publications, and we printed one for him. And I said, "Look, Bob, we're not printing one copy of this paper unless we get paid in advance with a certified check." He said, "Perfectly fine, absolutely." So this is all understood. And he invited me to the opening party up at the Mirror House and slightly north of central London. And um, so I went and the whole ground floor of the building was laid out like a, a kind of a circus, you know, and you had palm readers and, you know, fortune tellers and all this stuff and uh, all kinds of things like this. And, and uh, you, you know, those things you get at a amusement park, you shoot and knock the thing down and all, you know, all that sort of stuff. And, get, and the, the guy gets it done. You know, it was kind of fun. It was nice, you know. So uh, I, I, he, I, I eventually came over to me, grabbed me by the shoulder and said, They're, you're not printing me. I said, of course, I'm not printing. I've told you 20 times that I'm not printing anything until I get paid. <laughs> he said, I said, don't confuse me with the Minister of Education of Nigeria. And he said, you shouldn't say that. <laughs> he, got self he said, all right, all right, all right, if you're going to be a complete chiseler. I'm a chiseler wanting to get Chiseler for asking to get paid. <laughs> so he, he stormed into this little tent where some woman was trying to read somebody's palm, you see. And, and he said, get out, get out of here, you. And, and the tent was shaking and the card table almost collapsed. And he said, all right, all right. And he had a, wrote out a check and said, there you are, blood money. I mean, blood money, I'm printing his newspaper. All I want <laughs> is to get paid. You know, <laughs> like a bully uh, like that could be dangerous. Uh -huh. it, it, you know, I mean, I could, you know, I could say, you know, sh shove it, Bob. I don't give a damn what you, but a lot of people couldn't, you know. The day that, the day that he, um, his private properties, personal property like hats and walking sticks and things were being auctioned, Rupert Murdoch phoned me and he, and he said, I'm just phoning you to celebrate the fall of Maxwell. And I said, you know, Rupert, I, I, I feel badly about him being found floating around Biscayne Bay and, and uh, seeing his private property auctioned like this. And Rupert said, well, I don't. You didn't have to deal with that son of a bitch for 20 years like I did. He was the biggest crook I ever saw. And, <laughs> and the, you know, God, this is awful. But you know what the front page of the uh, Murdoch's tabloid paper, the son, uh, you know, was yeah, when he died? With all the girls? And, uh, yeah, well, they're in the page three, yeah. But they, they, on the <laughs> cover was, uh, it, it, they had a picture of Maxwell when he was recovered from the water. So the dye was out of his hair. It was all white hair like mine. And, 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 and it was this picture. And, you know, he owned the Daily Mirror. And the headline, I mean, Murdoch's a genius at these things. The mirror, <laughs> the headline was mirror, mirror on the wall who's the biggest crook of all <laughs> and that was <laughs> rupert's farewell to bob it was a rough league but Woo! as i say i i found him a, a a character and i kind of enjoyed him but he was dangerous and he was a bad man but but uh but i i, I liked his wife and i knew I, I know gilen and i knew two of the boys they were very nice all of them i think gilen was shafted she i think it was an awful sentence she got I mean, you're not going to get anybody to agree with you on that, do you think? I, I don't think I will, but that's not my point. I, I, don't, I, you know, I call it as I see it. I, look, sure. I, I'm not saying that she didn't do bad things. And if she did, I, obviously, there's a penalty for them. I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying but, to say I mean, if she knowingly was procuring underage girls for Jeffrey, uh, that, that, that is a bad thing. I'm, I don't absolutely. think absolutely on that issue, but where they use money seized from Jeffrey's estate to pay four women 
to come in as witnesses who haven't uttered a peep for 15 years and with uh, on denunciation only with no other evidence claim that Glenn did various things. I, I, I'm not convinced that that is a, a just conviction. That's mm-hmm. all I'm saying. And I think if it was a just conviction, it's an over sentence. What did they give her? 20 years? 20 years. The, 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 that's excessive. Gillen doesn't deserve 20 years in prison. She's, she's not. She's look, she I, 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 I have no standing to dispute that she did what she's been convicted of. I just I just think it wasn't a perfect conviction. But but 20 years is too much. I I. I... I've, I've I, I hope she gets it reduced, you know. I'm, yeah, I hope. I, I hope for. I mean, is anyone today. really going to object if it comes down to say eight years? That's a long time for someone to be in prison, you know. Well, I do. You think Jeffrey Epstein? Jeffrey um, uh, Epstein um, killed yeah. himself? You think he killed himself? Um, fifty-fifty, I'd say. I, I, I certainly wouldn't. Uh, from what I've seen of. Uh, now you know I, what I saw was the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and and uh, and that, he was in the New York House of Corrections there. But uh, uh, from what I've seen of those people, and and all this testimony about the cameras being off and people forgetting to look in on him for six hours and so on, it would uh, it would not surprise me in the slightest if he was murdered. But um, and it does surprise me a bit that that Jeffrey would do that because he had a good lawyer and. You know, if you're going to do that, do it after you've lost the case, not before. But um, uh, but Alan Dershowitz, who acted for him, thought that that he he did in fact commit suicide. So I, I have no standing to say, but I'd, I'd only say that it would not surprise me if he was murdered. What was that all about? What was what was the whole thing about? It, look, uh, it, 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 we never knew anything about that part of it. Whenever we saw them, that they were, uh, uh, you know, they were. Uh, sort of an attractive couple, frankly. And, and, you know, I was just a rich guy and his girlfriend. And, um, and I never knew anything about young girls around. I mean, he invited us to his island, but we didn't go. That's not the, I mean, I don't want to sound like an old dowager here, but that I wouldn't, my wife and I wouldn't want to do it. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd rather, you know, sit in my house in Palm beach and read a book or something, you know, but, um, uh, but, um, I guess he had this thing for young women. And I guess there's no doubt that he brought in relays of them. And uh, it, it, as far as I know, it's never been alleged that there was coercion. So you get into this fine line of at what point should he have known that they were underage or at what point should his um, methods of persuasion uh, 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 been moderated and and at what point they became completely improper. I mean, I, 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 I think you've got a lot of fine judgment there, but I, I think the long and short of it is it was a very shabby, nasty business. I mean, it's just, a, a, it's just again, I don't want to sound like a 94-year-old uh, right. rude, but you just don't take advantage of young girls. Of course but if not. Legally, was, under, you're not. You know, she, I mean, a she, rich man like that could could knock any, you know, ninety percent of young women off their feet. You know, even if they're of legal age to have consent. You know, and you, and you just don't do it. I mean, I but you know, I'm the old school. I'm a gentleman. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have anything to do with that. I, I, I but now the poor old Duke of York has taken a hit here. He he wouldn't have anything to do with that knowingly. And and uh, I, I think I, so. I, really? Sorry. Uh, no, I I just you know I feel you don't think Prince Andrew had anything to do with that. Uh, I don't think he knew there was anything improper going on. Uh, look, so he's a we, little, he's a, he's a, in the royal family. They don't need to, They're never exposed to anything like this. So he did. He thought, you know, here's a rich American. He's got, owns his own island. This is great stuff. I'm an unattached man overseas in discreet circumstances. I can do what I want. I, I mean, I, I think he didn't think it through, you know, but he was guilty of a lapse of taste and a lapse of judgment. There's no possibility in my mind that the Duke of York had had anything approaching the mens rea required for criminal conviction. The, the intent to commit a crime, he had none mm-hmm. of that. 
Uh, uh, Jeffrey, I wouldn't be so sure. Guillen, I wouldn't be so sure, though. It's, I, 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 the, well, frankly, the thing I don't understand about her is that once she saw what they did to Jeffrey, I, and by, I have to say, I'm sorry to interrupt myself here, but, you know, he made his deal in, in, uh, in Florida, and that was a deal for the whole federal system. And they, they reneged on that deal. Now, you know, maybe the deal made in Florida that Dershowitz negotiated for him, and, and that guy, I believe, was deemed ineligible to continue as Secretary of Labor because right. of, of his performance as a prosecutor. Um, uh, it may be, maybe the, they shot their bolt too soon and too cheaply. I don't know that. But but having committed themselves, just how suave is it for the government of the United States to do a complete 180 here and, and to smash his door down and drag him off his plane when he lands? And then he commits suicide. I mean, I don't think it's any thundering day of triumph for your, your justice system there either. But mm -hmm. what I was going to say, what amazes me about Gillen is she saw what happened to Jeffrey. It was long after they'd parted company. And... And, you know, she was a citizen of the UK and France. And and she could have gone and she had enough money to do it, obviously. I mean, she lived quite well where she was up in New England. She could have gone to France and lived there. And the French will not extradite any French citizen on a criminal charge. And so she, she'd be, you know, sitting in the Tour d'Argent having a glass of champagne right now uh, instead of in Sing Sing or whatever the hell she is. I'd be some woman's prison. I don't know which one. But but um, um, no, it's too bad. The whole thing is too bad. It was a, just a. It was a, it was very sad. The whole thing. You know, there's some school of thought, and I know that there are people who believe this ardently. That there's just this whole cabal of people, cabal of people who take advantage of young kids, and you know, and Jeffrey Epstein. Yeah, Jeffrey was fronting the whole thing, and and that. Um, he extorted blackmail from them, and that's where his money came from. Yeah, he, he, not that kind of money, not 600 million bucks. You don't extort 600 million bucks on that sort of thing. Um, but, but I, I mean, I think there is ample reason to believe that bad things happened. I, I'm not trying to whitewash it. Please mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't mm -hmm. misunderstand that. No, 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 no. No, I, I get the, I get the, I understand about the uh, prosecution. And that they paying witnesses and that sort of thing. Um, like I, 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 I'll tell you one very short story. Unseemly. I do have to go actually, but um, we had a guest book in our house in Palm Beach, and I have it here now. And I, ha I was looking up something a couple of months ago. I got to this dinner, where the you know the guests sign on the way out. You see, so there was Melania Knaus, as she then was, Donald Trump. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein, Gillen wow. Maxwell, uh, Terry Allen Kramer, you know, Allen and Company, the merchant bank, and her man, Nick, and um, Arno de Borschgrove. Do you remember him? The, no, uh, I don't. He was the editor of the Washington Times and before oh. that, Paris oh, okay. editor of Newsweek. Great, great journalist, a very learned man, and his wife, Victoria. So I said, look, to my wife, Barbara, I said, look, Unfortunately, Arno is dead, Terry is dead, Nick is dead, Victoria has vanished, Jeffrey is dead. We know about Gillen. Next to Donald and Melania, we're the success story at this dinner. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Melania, a very engaging uh, raconteur herself. Can you call a woman a raconteur? Uh, I wouldn't say a raconteur would be if you want to be... Uh technical but uh um i wouldn't say exactly that she's humorous though but uh, you know in, in that way that some people are funny with few words and and it, uh, so you she arranges it if you're trying to extract something humorous she arranges it so that you end up putting a question to her and then she says uh, something like well what do you think or uh -huh. I get so or something, but the way she does it is funny, you know. So, so she's she, not saying it. <laughs> oh no, no, she's clever and she's got yeah. a sense of humor, but she's a 
she's she she sees everything you know she doesn't miss a trick and uh, and and she occasionally just sort of rolls her eyes a bit she can't believe what's happening i mean i mean with as donald's companion she's seen some pretty funny stuff you know but uh <laughs> but no but I, I i i there's i can't think of a negative thing about her she's i mean apart from her obvious allure uh, physically and her dress taste is she's a very nice person mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very nice and, and very intelligent yes i was going to ask you how what a mm. what a uh person is she, is she in a good addition to any dinner table conversation oh yeah, yeah. And, and then she always, she's she's perceptive you know she's a she's clever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh political and strat strategic history of the world volume one from antiquity to the caesars 14 a.d um, and I know we got to go, but was there anything that you was surprised you or did you know everything prior to going in and additionally uh, doing any more uh, investigation? It, 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 you mean in that book? Yeah. Surprises. <laughs> well, probably not a surprise you, for you. You, you, but... you flatter me, Victoria. Look, that's a great deal. <laughs> I had no idea. You're the I, one who wrote I, the book. I can't believe somebody like, you know, you are. Did you ever go, what am I doing? Was, I, 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 once I got through it, I could hardly believe I did it. But now I'm three quarters of the way through the next one, which will take us right up to, almost to the American Revolution. I'm up to I'm finished with Queen Elizabeth and Shakespeare now. So I'm, you know, I'm I'm moving up here. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, all kinds of things were news to me. But I'll, I'll just cite one, if I may. I had no idea that when Alexander the Great died, following following that event. There were 50 years of civil war throughout his entire empire, which stretched from the Adriatic Sea to India. I, I, I mean, it's a long way. It, it was civil war almost constantly for 50 years between the people who had been his principal subordinates. And in the course of that, his child was murdered, his wife was murdered, his sister was murdered, and finally, his mother was stoned to death. And he was, along with Julius Caesar and Napoleon, and I guess Genghis Khan, the greatest conqueror in the history of the world. And, and you know, the others had their problems, but their families survived, all right. And, uh, I mean, they all, Caesar, of course, was assassinated, but the other two died of natural causes. But in, in, in all three cases, their families survived, all right. And, and Caesar's chosen heir, his grand nephew, Octavian, continued in office for nearly 60 years. But with Alexander the Great, they murdered everybody. It was a, a, the most appalling mess. And I didn't know anything about that. Hmm. Well, I'm not there yet. I'm still <laughs> hoping to get to the Peloponnesian War pretty soon here. Yeah, you'll, if, you're, if you're dealing with Pericles, you're about just almost there. Yeah. It did, um, I, as you see, found Pericles admirable, but he was one of these guys who was a bit unrealistic. That's why I compared him to Gorbachev in one place you'll come to. Oh, did you? I didn't see yeah. that. How did I not see that? Um, no, no, you'll get to it. Okay. Uh, and you start you start the book with the Jews. So is there some reason? Uh, is there well, nothing... the ancient Mesopotamia, and then, then they emerged from there. And, you know, they were unique because of their monotheism. Um, the the Jews and the Greeks start very early, and they're the only group apart from the Chinese and the Indians that come all the way through. Hmm. Well, I hope this empire survives, and will understand the I don't know the telltale signs of the end of the end of the country by reading this book because hmm. you, you should be good for a good while yet. I Remember, so. Rome, the Roman Empire went for 700 years in the West and then another thousand years in the East. And after a hiatus of about 100 years, w w it made a recovery in Rome itself as the religious center of the world. And it exercised as much authority at times through the Middle Ages, through the Pope, as it had through its emperors. So. Uh, the, the United States has a has a long run ahead of it. It's like okay. the play, the mousetrap. It'll never close. <laughs> it never ends and it'll never close. Thank you so much, Conrad Black. Thank you, Victoria. Lovely to talk with you. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of the Adult in the Room podcast. To keep the programs you like to listen to, please rate this podcast with a fantastic five stars on your Apple Podcast app every time you listen. And give me a great review. Plus, of course, subscribe to the podcast. It makes a difference with the big tech algorithm and the big tech oligarchs. And it makes us easier to find. Please get in touch with me on all the big tech stuff. Yeah, we're still there. Using the names Victoria Taft or the Adult in the Room podcast on MeWe, Parlor, Minds, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks to 1A Cast for imaging, editing, and production. The fantastic song is Gospel by the March 4th Band of Portland, Oregon. Music for Antifa versus Mike Strickland is Ride or Die by Raps by RC. The Adult in the Room podcast is also a production of Flamingo Road Studios. Remember, head up, heart out, and strive to be the adult in the room. Till next time, mischief managed.